Hi, I'm Andrew, and this is Keen on Democracy. A chill is enveloping the world. Everywhere I go these days, the conversation is the same. Everyone is fearful about the fate of democracy in our digital age. The same worried question is on all of our lips. What or who is killing democracy? Everybody wants to know. There's certainly no lack of suspects. Trump, Putin's trolls, Mark Zuckerberg, authoritarian populism, the wall, Viktor Urban, fake news, Brexit, Bolsonaro, surveillance capitalism, Erdogan, Twitter, or last but certainly not least, the president of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. So what's up with democracy these days? Is it really dying? Or is it simply shedding its industrial analog skin and updating itself for our networked digital age? That's the subject of this podcast series. This is a show featuring conversations about the most important issue of our age with some of the world's most incisive thinkers. I hope it both provokes and enlightens. So far in this podcast, our conversations have been a little abstract on the relationship between digital technology and politics. Today we get more specific, country-specific, Estonia-specific. As some of you will know, the little Baltic Republic of Estonia is the world's leading innovator of digital democracy. So today we talk with the country's former CTO, Tavi Kotka, who many credit as the technological wizard behind the construction of Estonian digital democracy. As Kotka explained to me when I visited him in his office in Tallinn, there are only two models for 21st century digital democracy, the centralized Chinese model or the decentralized Estonian one. Tavi Kotka, the former Estonian CTO and now the CEO of Proud Engineers. Tavi, is there such a thing as digital democracy? It's an interesting question from the perspective that if you ask, is it possible to vote over the internet? And then the answer definitely is yes. But if you ask, are those digital tools truly help people like create new initiatives in legislation, etc., then there I'm actually quite skeptic. Because, I mean, 10 years ago we created a portal that was called Today I Decide. It was meant to be that whoever wants to initiate a new uh, government legislative, so like you just post it there, you find enough companions who actually align with your mindset. And if you gather enough signatures, like digital signatures, the parliament has to uh, take this into consideration. But the reality was that people don't care. Even if you have all those tools, People, they want to live their own life and they are not eager to like, push new ideas, new legislation, everything. So it's a tough question. I mean, uh, yes, you can use those tools to make your voice more heard, but on the same time, the democracy itself, that like, people actually actively are involved of, let's say, country's development, that doesn't happen. But let me rephrase the question. You're one of the principal architects of the implementation of digital technology and government in Estonia. What were you trying to do? Or what are you trying to do in Estonia? What is the Estonian experiment when it comes to electronic government? Estonia had actually a very clear challenge. We have a huge amount of land. Land-wise, we are bigger than Switzerland or Netherlands. But we only have 1.3 million people living here. So it was clear, especially for the private sector and also the government, that the only way how to govern this country or efficiently run this country is to push people to use internet. Self-service instead of physical service. So we had a pain that pushed us towards the digital solution. Digital democracy or like being digital society has never been a goal itself. Always the goal was to also how you govern this small amount of people. You can't have a bank office in every small town. You can't have a government office in every you village. You say it was obvious, but yeah. I'm sure it wasn't obvious to everybody. And you were the first country to do this. And there are many other countries in the world which are sparsely inhabited. I think one of the important things were that those reforms were done uh, in 1990s, year 2000. And the people understanding or knowledge about, uh, how say, internet and digitalization, it wasn't very high. 
they embraced all these new technologies and new opportunities with like open mindset and there wasn't too many fears and uh, when they start to see the benefits i mean you can declare the taxes with a couple of clicks you don't have to go physically in to meet the government officer everything can be done digitally they liked it and then they started to demand it everywhere like in healthcare in education i mean they want to get the same kind of easy access hassle free experience in all the sectors and that has been a driver for us plus the politicians the politicians uh, understood that if they talk about digital stuff they get votes so the goal is really just efficiency like i said you can't have a government officer in every village and you can't have a bank office in every small town i mean 20 years ago it was how to teach elderly people to use atm for example but now obviously it's more complicated but back then that's how it started it's how it started but it's not how it finished because it's not just about efficiency in estonia it's also about fairness isn't it and about respecting people's rights even without digitalization those values would be important it's not just digitalization but i can say yeah it's mostly because that's the only way how you can efficiency run the country i mean if you look at our government budget like for example or government cost they want the smallest in europe just because like everything happens without physical service but let's say we were in beijing and you were an architect of the chinese government's digitalization efforts you might say the same thing it's the only way to run the country and i guess in a sense if you watch everything everyone's doing that's also a form of efficiency but that's not what you chose in estonia yes like because fundamentally we are democratic countries and in china they have showed that you can actually build great stuff not being a democratic country and that's actually a thing i mean if i great look, stuff from the point of view of a, a, an I engineer mean, like yourself the, yeah like from the teacher the government perspective i think china is number one at the moment it might be a bold statement but the way how they have built the baseline the way they have built the systems I mean it's central system like one big central system so uh like it works that's very chilling isn't it but that's like they way to organize themselves like on the same time if you look at UK for example at the moment you haven't done any of those core reforms needed for a digital society like your baseline is very weak and to be honest listening your politicians listening your engineers who try to sell those ideas to politicians democracy is killing you because you need certain baseline to make it happen I mean Estonia has chosen decentralized way so everything is decentralized every information bit is cut to very small pieces so like UK could do the same thing but for to doing that you need certain political reforms and I can't see them happening in UK for it so the Estonian government's initiative is partly about the organization and collection of data of individual data and allowing people to sort of efficiently access their healthcare records and bank details and taxation How do you preserve their liberty though in this system? How did you try to create an Estonian e-government system that's in some ways the antithesis of say China who are obsessed with surveillance? There are like some uh, preconditions to this. For example, there's what no one big system administrator. There's no one guy who can control it all. Not even the government, not even the guy like yourself who built it. First of all, like there are many people who built this system. It wasn't me. And it decentralized means that every department every ministry every hospital they build their own systems and the system administrator of that department hospital etc those system administrators most probably can access that data but not outsiders like me or like any other person in this country or the police the police always has certain access i mean but for that they actually have to have court order and everything So uh home security is is always a, like I'll say additional chapter like if there is a potential terrorism or, or like criminal case obviously police can access databases but there is no one big database or one big portal to access those databases so uh that's how we actually work whenever we need information you can ask it from another database but you have to have a legal base for that like why you access that why you need this information we have data inspection authority and they always review this legal base plus in many cases here in estonia people own their data meaning that they actually allow to give you an access so you're empowering the user so the gdpr for example what happened in eu this year like uh, for us it's a great thing that's how it the thing should move in europe let's say a big bad power invaded estonia couldn't they hoover up all this data yes they can but we also have uh, like you with your family photos 
there's always a chance that you, will, you might lose them all. And to avoid that, you do copies, you do backups. What we have been doing already more than 13 years, backupping the, basically the country outside from Estonia. So we could actually run it from, uh, we call them data embassies, like, so we could run them from data embassies. Yeah, my understanding of that is that was a sort of legacy of what happened uh, when your uh, library was taken over. I mean, it certainly works this way that a good example is like in 1991, when we broke apart from Soviet Union, there was a question like, who are Estonians? Because there were many like Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians living in Estonia. So how can we differentiate who is Estonian, who is not Estonian? And there was a law that said that if you were living in Estonia before Second World War, or any of your ancestors was living in Estonia before Second World War, you are automatically Estonian. But how do you prove that? So the only way to prove that is that you rely on old archive materials. But nowadays, we don't have any paper archives. Everything is digital, everything is in the registries. And let's say we have to restore in 2040. It's an unlikely case, but let's say in 2040, we have to restore what we had in 2020. How are we going to do that? So we need that back about to be outside of Estonia, to be somewhere like in a safe place. We do this example, but we are like Lord Voldemort in Harry Potter, who puts the soul in different places and whenever he needs to be born again, like it's born again. Does the Estonian e-government system, does that leave a space for anonymity? Or alternatively, do people need now to be more accountable about what they do and how they behave online in Estonia? The Estonian system is built in a need-to-know basis. It means that, for example, um, hospital has all the information about you, what has happened in that hospital video. But whenever you visit the doctor, the doctor like, can access your medical uh, information also in other hospitals. So he or she actually has a full understanding what has happened with you and she or he can provide a better health care to you. So in that case, there is no anonymity. On the same time, those doctors are not allowed to access those records without your knowledge. Plus, you always see who has accessed your data. And that's how you control it. You can always run the query like, why this doctor or policeman, why have he checked my data? If there is no proper explanation, the person gets fired immediately. And if the person actually passed that information to the third person, let's say a journalist, he or she goes to jail. So if I ask from you, I mean, uh, do you know who has accessed your medical health records during the last six months in the UK? I don't live in the UK. Okay. Well, you're in the US. US. Okay, US. Uh, and no, I have no idea. Fortunately, they wouldn't find anything very interesting. But Yeah, but that's like what we believe, that gathering data, connecting data, is not a problem. As long as a person itself, himself or herself can control who has access. And then you have a full transparency there. Because if the departments are able to, let's say, exchange data among, between the, each other, you don't have to like, hustle and run from one ministry to another ministry, I don't know, for, to get the construction permit, for example. So everything moves. We always give a chance, this Google right to be forgotten thing that, uh, for example, if there is like some medical information that you are shy about and you want to delete that, we call it covering. So you can cover data. So you can always cover data. It actually stays there for scientific purposes, but no doctors can see that. Can you have fake news in the Estonian system in Obviously. the sense that people can't just post stuff anonymously as they can, say, in the US? Is that right? No, no. Fake news is there. Fake news is a totally different thing. Plus, there are portals who allow you to comment articles only if you are logged in uh, and logged in with your national ID. Those are the newspapers, right? Yeah, some of them. There are also portals who actually allow anonymity. So mm. it's always like two sides. Anonymity also creates lots of hate in society. Mm. And it's actually an experience of Finland, not only uh, from Estonia, that in Finland uh, removed anonymous comments in news portals themselves they're saying that society became better i mean i can't say um, actually i don't read comments anymore like but you used to yeah i used to there's no need there's no value to read those comments like in terms of what's been accomplished in estonia what are you most proud of what would you like to see exported to other countries i think the whole government model that you can build the digital society in a democratic way Plus, in a way that if it's decentralized, means that people can enjoy the benefits of the system 
it's less hassle, etc. But on the same time, like it's not one big database with all the threats to the I don't know, privacy and data protection. Right? You actually can build a system that works and can be trusted. I think that we should be proud of. If you had the CTO of a large country come to you at Proud Engineers and said, we're really impressed with what's happened in Estonia. We want to replicate it in, I don't know, the United States or Brazil or another large country. How do you begin this? What are the key things to have in place? You obviously need the political will and the capital. To be honest, we wrote the book about it. We wrote the digital handbook for digital transformation and it describes 126 steps what needs to be accomplished to make it happen. 126 steps. Yeah. So it's like IKEA instruction, like so. Uh, only, only an engineer would come up with 126 <laughs> steps. 126 <laughs> steps to create digital democracy. Yeah. So actually, we need to add. Two. Are they all the same length steps? Surely some of them are no, more no, important no, no, than no, others. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the point is that digital society, I think, it's 20% about technology, 20% about legal, 20% about PR, like explaining all this and then now say get people on board. And 40% is about organizational thinking and organizational change. Technologically, I mean, it starts from the very small things. Like, for example, you have to have enough internet everywhere because if there is not enough internet, people cannot access uh, digital society. There is no point. Like, that's just the crown basic. Another crown basic is that you have to have an ability to connect different databases. So it means unique identifiers. Like in North Europe, in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Estonia, Every person has a unique identifier, and that person is like unique identifier is, is used everywhere in healthcare, in taxation, in private sector. So whenever you need to connect different databases, let's say like a bank with insurance, with the hospital data, etc., you can do it because everybody uses the same unique identifier. And those kinds of things I'm actually missing. Let's say in the UK, in the US, in Canada, you have a unique identifier in healthcare, but that the same unique identifier cannot be used, let's say in uh, labor databases or like in private bank. So uh, there are certain elements, like certain engineering elements that need to be built in place, but also some legal stuff, etc. And what we provide in Estonia, we actually help those different governments, not US in particular, but like we have done uh, a similar pilot implementations in Canada, for example, and in Mexico, and uh, I mean, in most of the countries in the world. Do you think that the model that you've been pioneering, is it insurance against anti-democratic populism? No. Anti-democratic populism remains. You can make people's life easier, less hassle. This doesn't kill the current trends we see in the world. But the point is that, coming back to the Christian building of digital society, to be honest, as an engineer, I can assure there are only two ways. Central system, like China, and decentralized system, like North Europe. So it's not just Estonia. The same model is in Denmark, the same model is in Sweden, the same model is in Finland. So there are only two ways to go. One is democratic way, basically. Another thing is like autocratic, centralized way. We can debate it today here, but if you ask me like where US will be after, let's say, 10, 15 years, I would assume they will end up with the same system we have here. So uh, because there are like no more ways to build that digital society from the engineering perspective. There's no way of mixing the two systems? There's no, no like, gray uh, area between the two? Uh, there is, but like, Mixing means that how much you centralize, how big are the central blocks. Like, for example, will there will be every hospital having their own system or one big hospital system? So that's the difference. And then the one big hospital system is decentralized, is way connected with insurance, let's say. So that's the gray area. But in the big scale, if you see like how the, the large systems evolve, like how they are built, 90% plus sure. So this is the great choice that all countries have to face in the 21st century, whether to become like Estonia or China. From the engineering perspective, yes. But from the engineering, for sure, but also from the political. I mean, Austria, for example, tries to build a democratic solution on top of centralized systems. It's not so absolute and uh, not so clear, but it actually comes down to the organizational models. I mean, governments are actually like large enterprises. Every department takes care of their own stuff. And you want them to take care of their own stuff. It's actually efficient that they also take care of their own IT systems. And if every department takes care of their own IT system, you automatically get a decentralized model. Doesn't this depend on the receptivity of politicians, that politicians have to get it, and that you were lucky that you had 
politicians who understood technology and were sympathetic to your worldview? That's actually a funny question, to be honest. Why is it a funny question? Because I think they were not smart enough to understand that. Like 20 so years you ago. educated them? No, it's, I mean, once again, it wasn't me. I mean, I mean well, your team there, there has to be like many, many people. No, I understand that, yeah. I think they were busy doing other things because, I, let's say, we broke apart in 1991. So mm. we had to create the whole new legislative like, from scratch. So many things like in agriculture, in, I don't know, like uh, in machinery, everything was broken. So we had to all build that up. So the focus was there and nobody noticed that, oh, there is an like, IT development going on at the, on the same time. So I think they were, they were not focused back then. And that was good that they didn't focus. They didn't have time to think about it like, too much. But now they're very proud of it. Now when you talk to your, uh, I've talked to a couple of your presidents and they both are very keen on digital democracy and your achievements there. Yes, they are proud of that. And that's the point. I mean, whoever starts to build it today, there are so many examples. They are like North European countries, they are like examples. Or China is an example. 20 years ago, there wasn't any examples. So we just had to be the pathfinders. But today, yes, you can, we can pick, okay, this reform from Denmark, this reform from Sweden, this reform, this model from Estonia. There's a variety of choices to choose from. I basically can't understand, like, in the United States, why the hell you are still waiting? Like, why not you don't act? Like, because you don't believe that digitalization is the future in government also, or what? Didn't Obama try it? Obama tried, yes. And why did he fail? There is a trap being built. Life is good in the U.S. Large scale, life is good. You mean the standard of living? Is yes, like, and uh, you can always ask from yourself, like, okay, but the systems are working. Like, why should we change them? Why should we connect them? Basically, there is no pain in your society that's pushing you towards the digital transformation. And that's why government officer says, like, my life is convenient, and uh, to start changing it means, like, uh, my life might get complicated. I might get fired. Even though there's one uh, interesting thing is that if you build a digital government, it doesn't reduce the amount of government officers. Yes, it changes the way, like, what work they do, but they will remain, remain in the system. The problem is that there's not enough pain in your society, and that's why you're not changing. What still needs to be accomplished in Estonia? Oh, no, no, no. We, are not even, we haven't even started. What I play with at the moment, what we do is that we run these different artificial intelligence models in government. So we basically, if you have all this information stored, and if you are able to co combine all those data sets, what you can start doing is future prediction modeling. So you actually can predict that there is, let's say, 80% of chance that we might lose 3,000 jobs in chemical industry in East Estonia. So you can't start having these kind of predictions. And if you have those kind of predictions, if you have real-time data, it totally changes the way how the country can be run. Obviously, we have a problem at the moment because we still have these elected politicians like, who are not on the level of doing anything with that data. But at least we have a new era. We have a new ability to run this country differently. And I think that's the future, how the countries will be run everywhere. Like. So uh, the future is technocracy. Doing better policy and decisions thanks to technology. So if you call it technocracy, then yes. And what's the role of politicians? Or indeed, what's the role of human beings in this society? I mean, in the end of the day, we actually at least try to do everything for the human benefit. Our role is still to live, but the role of politicians uh, definitely changes. I mean, like, they have to be way smarter because you have seen this uh, in sports. I mean, uh, even I think in baseball and in other sports that whenever there was like one guy who started to use or rely on data and had like great uh, results because like mm. he used data first. Right. So you will see the same thing in politics, like that the debate between populist and really well-prepared and then how say the data supported the politicians like the populists will, will actually lose. Are we seeing any examples of that yet? We see those examples in North Europe, but we can't see this, let's say, in the US because you just can't combine data. Like your baseline is weak, actually broken. And that's why like one guy can shout whatever he wants to shout. And do you see the rise of new political parties built around 
interpretation of data? Uh, not yet, but definitely this will happen. You think it will yeah, replace it will the old happen. parties of the industrial age? Or like, I don't know if they uh, will be replaced, but there will be a new generation of politicians who think this way. They might be in the inside of the old parties because if you build a party, the engine that you need to run it countrywide from scratch is basically very hard to do and it needs a huge discipline and a huge amount of money. It's actually easier to do a reform inside a party. So AI and data will kill populism. The populism always remains, but it will uh, give an, another angle to that. But the, the guys in China who use it well, that will strengthen their dictatorship. Have you been in Singapore? Yes. Do you like it? Well, I'm ambivalent about it. Well, I mean, it's clean, it's, it's half, secure. Yeah, it's like, halfway between China and yeah, so, Estonia. And sometimes you ask yourself, like, life quality there is super high. Streets are clean. Everything is pure, etc. And the fact that they actually measure your body temperature to know if you are, is there, will there be a riot or not? Like, so, I mean, uh, if you don't think about it, like, life is good. Smart nation. So you think that's a good thing? I mean, it's another way to build this kind of stuff. Like many reforms in Estonia, we have been doing, we call it innovation for pain. It means that we explain the pain to the society and then we do a reform. Let's say we pushed all the teachers to use e-school. And that's one of the reasons why education is so good in Estonia, because everybody has to use the learning management systems. And it was painful for the teachers. But it was extremely well accepted by the parents, extremely well accepted by the students. And we saw Estonia currently is like among top countries in, in education in Europe, way ahead of US, for example, because we use technology there a lot. Or the same in healthcare. Sometimes you have to push. Like, and, and I'm not sure if you can't do that kind of push in US or UK, but it has worked here. You're listening to Keen on Democracy with your host, Andrew Keen. Hello, I'm Jason Sanderson, the producer of the show, and this interview is with Tavi Kotka. Stick around as Andrew will be back after a quick break while we hear from our sponsors. Hi, my name is Steffi Czerny, and I'm the founder of the DLD Conferences. DLD is short for Digital Life Design and explores how the digital age fundamentally changes our world. Founded in Munich in 2005, DLD is now a globally connected community of thinkers, doers, and communicators. We host conferences in Munich, New York, Tel Aviv, Singapore, and Brussels. And we are very proud of our interdisciplinary outlook and even more so of our track record of discovering trend topics early on. Andrew Keen is a long-time, long-term DLD friend who has done many interviews at DLD conferences. If you like this podcast, you should join one of our events. Our motto for this year is optimism and courage. We want to put a really positive spin on recent technological developments from AI through blockchain to quantum computing and discuss which impact they have on business as well as politics and society. Visit our website at dld.co and apply for your ticket. Thanks so much for sticking around. Now here's Andrew with his five takeaways from this interview with Tavi Kotka. So as Tavi Kotka made unambiguously clear, we have two choices for engineering 21st century digital politics. It's what he aptly calls the great choice. Either the centralized Chinese model controlled by an Orwellian actor like the Chinese state communist party or leader, or the decentralized Estonian model with its built-in checks and balances against Big Brother. The choice is ours, or at least our government's. And it's this choice that will determine the nature of democracy in the 21st century. As Kotka explained, the Estonian model represents a new kind of social contract between the digital state and digital citizen in our age of big data. This social contract represents a digital kind of transparency about accessing personal data. Yes, Kotka acknowledges, all our personal information will reside in some sort of giant database in the sky. But in the Estonian decentralized model, he notes, 
we will always be notified when a policeman, a tax officer or a politician looks at our data. And it's this mutual transparency which distinguishes the Estonian model from the unaccountable data dictatorship being constructed in China. And then there's the third category of countries like the United States or Great Britain, which are doing very little to create any kind of digital politics. What the hell are you waiting for? An incredulous Kotka asks about the US and UK, the two most notable laggards in any kind of digital innovation. Amen. Perhaps there's a fourth category too. Estonia and China represent kinds of bookends in the centralized and decentralized models of 21st century politics. But as Kotka notes, some countries, like Austria or Singapore, are caught somewhere in between these two ideal types. And he may be right to suggest that the smart city experiment in Singapore, with its highly effective technological reforms of education and healthcare, represents the best case of synthesizing the Chinese and Estonian models. Life in Singapore is good, Kotka says. No, not perfect, but good. What is clear is that what Tavi Kotka and his colleagues have engineered in Estonia is only the beginning of our collective 21st century digital political experiment. In Estonia's digital democracy, he says, we haven't even started running AI. And AI, he notes, changes everything because it enables what he calls a future predictive model for politics. The most effective politicians of the future, he predicts, will use these models to shape and execute their agenda. So Moneyball is coming to politics, he rightly predicts. And just as it's revolutionized professional sports, so it's going to change everything about politics. Next week, we return to Estonia for a part two on how this tiny Baltic Republic is trying to reinvent democracy in the digital age. Guests include the architect of the country's unique e-residency program, as well as critics of these digital reforms. I look forward to talking with you again then.